Welcome to All Hands, a podcast brought to you by Lattice, where people success is business success. I'm your host, Caitlin Holloway. What if I told you there was a way to increase productivity, reduce stress, and encourage work-life balance for your people? Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, that's exactly the promise of the four-day work week. Companies like Microsoft, Unilever, and even the government of Iceland have piloted this and they have seen impressive results. Today, I talk with an early adopter of the four-day work week. Joel Gascoigne is the CEO of Buffer, a dashboard that lets businesses analyze and plan their content. Now, Buffer has been on the forefront of many people-forward policies over the last 10 years. So when the pandemic amped up the stress on his people, Joel once again took a people-focused approach. I heard it best described as you have work and you have maybe leisure or your family time. And then there's also this like other piece that most people don't have, but it's, I've heard it described as idleness, pure rest. And for me, that's just thinking, but the disconnect from the work helps the work. Buffer is now two years into this four-day workweek experiment. Joel shares pros, cons, and what he wished he knew when he first set out on this journey. Joel, welcome to All Hands. Thanks, Caitlin. It's great to be here. Excited for the conversation. So happy to have you on the show. This is a topic that I am so excited to get into. We're going to go very deep on the notion of a four-day work week. But before we get into that goodness, if you could please, for for a second, share with our audience uh, a little bit more about yourself. I'm Joel. I'm the founder CEO of Buffer. I started Buffer about, it'll be 12 years towards the end of this year. So it's been a long and up and down journey throughout that. I'm originally from the UK, so I'm, I'm living in Boulder, Colorado now. I love that place. I love it here. We moved in 2018, so before the pandemic. And you all, to be clear, Buffer was actually fully remote pre-pandemic, right? That's correct. We have been fully remote pretty much since our inception. So yeah, we've been, we have been remote for, I would say, you know, 10 years now and, and figured out a lot of this, the way of doing things that works for us on, in remote. You all are so ahead of the curve on, on so much of this. And so knowing that you all had that muscle way ahead of time probably enabled you to think more creatively about what it means to be at work and what was going to work best for your organization. Can we jump into the four-day work week? I am dying to know yeah. everything about it. Yeah, let's do it. And it's actually interesting, I guess, to kind of like connect it to the to remote work because we were remote already. It allowed us to think about other things that we could be considering at the, the onset of the pandemic when we felt that impact in early you know, 2020. Every company at the beginning of the pandemic was scrambling to, you know, where's the pandemic playbook? How can we help engage our people? How can we support our people? At least the great companies were doing that. Yep. And so as you all were putting your heads together, uh, saying, hey, look, we already have that that flexibility that's needed right now for people to work from from wherever they may be. How how did this idea of the four-day work week get put on the table? Where what was the genesis? Yeah. So the, the four-day work week for us at Buffer, I would say, has been one of those things that's been thrown around many, many times over the years. And we've always aimed to you know, explore and experiment and try different things within how we work. We had a phase of the company where we tried having no managers and being, you know, totally, completely mm. flat. Um, holacracy. Yeah. Holacracy. Yeah. We had our own uh, ex- exploration of that. Didn't work out for us. We learned a lot from that. But, you know, four day work week. Yeah. Or, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The concepts around the four day work week we had talked about quite a bit. I personally have always, enjoyed experimenting with how I spend my time working, not working, you know, other things. Way back, I remember I have a blog post I wrote about a seven-day work week, which sounds extreme, and the opposite direction of a four-day work week. That was a failure, (laughs) but I, yeah, enjoyed trying a lot of different things. So the four-day work week, it'd been floating around enough, and then, and then the pandemic happened, and lockdowns happened, and people are, you know, especially parents, you know, you've got kids at home, it's just chaos. And so we just started thinking like, what can we do to help here? And it was also, what can we do to help our 
customers. So we kind of end up with this like three pronged thought process around how can we get through this as a business, that the business matters. How can we help customers get through this? And we serve small businesses. So we had a lot of a lot of customers impacted and we experienced churn, which kind of relates to the business aspect as well. And then how can we help our team get through this? At least to the extent that we can, obviously this is a, a big external force that impacts far beyond work, but what can we do um, to, to help smooth things out a little bit and reduce some of that anxiety and, and the challenges? Pretty quickly, the four-day work week came to our minds. Initially, we threw around the idea of what about a Friday off every month or things like that. I was kind of thinking, well, we've talked about it before, so why not just go all the way? What, what about we just actually try a four-day work week? There's so much in here I, I have questions about. Let me start with actually a personal question here. So knowing that you have been tinkering with time and productivity and output for as long as you have, something you said stood out to me, and it was something that I think was on, on the top of mind for, for many organizations at the start of the pandemic was parents. Parents have easily been one of the communities that has been incredibly impacted by this. I have two young kids at home myself. Do you have children at home? Yes. So I, I became a parent in the pandemic. So I have a 13 month old ah. becoming a parent and dealing with all the, the challenges. And, you know, we're still in the pandemic, right? So there's still challenges. You know, it's a little different than the that first maybe six to 12 months, but right. it's still, we're still in the thick of it. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Kids really mess with the time space continuum, like on a good day in a normal scenario. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's very true. I, I, I mean, the first couple of months, I, I, I remember actually feeling this new appreciation of time and just um, the key thing I recall about time in the first two months of being a parent was just that, like, well, now, now you're in the present. There's no, there's no way around. You can't think about past or future at this point in time because, you know, I, he's sleeping now, but he could be awake in two minutes, or he might be sleeping for. 40 minutes, who knows? So <laughs> it really forced me to, to say, okay, what can I do right now? Just that that focus in, in that moment. And then of course the focus in the moments with him and the presence there as well and having to be really present um, too. So yeah, obviously a beautiful thing to, to experience. I used to tell people, you know, what's something that you learned um, after you became a mother? And th that was essentially my answer. As I said, my children taught me how to be mindful. I did not have a mindfulness practice prior to children, uh, but it was forced upon me. Speaking of, of being parents, the early days of the pandemic, that was maybe the catalyst for you all choosing to do this, saying, hey, this is the perfect time for us to try and to, to almost have what we thought would be a time box around it, right? So trial period, you know, given to us on a platter. But before all of that, I there are things that I've heard you say in the past, more, more specifically around your goal as a CEO as managing people over profit. And you saw in 2020 worker stress and burnout as a debt. Can you share a little bit more about people over profit? Yeah, absolutely. This is a, a longer term belief that operating it just with people over profit in mind is going to ultimately also lead to profit. Um, in, in the most optimal way. I think 2020 was an especially unique time where I just felt like this is just the right thing to do and let's get through this without incurring like more of a, a debt in a way. You know, reflecting on it in the early uh, first month or so, I just arrived at this conclusion and belief that I want to get through it as much as is possible. I don't even know if we fully succeeded necessarily, but can we get through it without everyone being completely burned out? And that felt like the right thing if, to do if you care about people. It also felt like the right thing to do as a business because we would likely be able to retain those people more. And there's obviously so much that happened since then. There's the, the great resignation, which we've not completely escaped ourselves, but yeah. um, that was the motive. It's also more of a long-term belief, I will say, offer is is a little we're, we're a little weird um we <laughs> we've done two rounds of funding we've also um spent 3.3 .3 million buying out our main vc investors which we did in mid 2018 um for me all of that is congratulations is, thank you yeah 
Yeah, and it's it's really all about can we follow our own true, you know, des- destiny in a way like what what we the path that it, we are uniquely well placed to go. Can we go there like wholeheartedly? And I'm not saying you can't find VCs that would fully support that, but it sometimes can be challenging. I, I, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and and those are the those are the VCs you want for sure. It's really about that more of that alignment um, with with the mission and the approach of the company. So that's you know even to tie that back to people over profit. It just allows us to very clearly say we. And for me, the goal with Buffer, you know, I'm almost 12 years in at this point, and I want to go another decade. I'm just as excited now as I was in the first few years. I don't say that lightly. I really want to create a company that thrives and also goes through multiple cycles, market cycles, <laughs> pandemics, I guess. Now we, we had to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, adapting as we need to and staying nimble in order to exist long term. And so things change a little bit. I think when you make that the goal, you're not trying to, you know, yeah. uh, exit at the high. You're really going through all the ups and downs, creating a real business, thinking about profitability, being more self-sustaining, things like that. I love so much about everything that you just said. And I, I I will double down on the idea of people over profits, but I think that we should expand that to include more of what you just shared. People over profits will create a sustainable, thriving culture that will in turn create outsized returns, right? That's what I'm hearing you say. 100%. This isn't just hey, we're here to to run a nonprofit and we just enjoy one another's company. This is about really creating yes. a sustainable business that puts people at the heart of, of what it is that we are doing every single day, whether those people are your employees or your customers. That's something else that I want to point out for, for our audience is that you, you have brought up your customers several times in this conversation already around wanting to do what's right by them as well. And I it is we share the belief that if you do right by people, regardless of what cohort they sit in, in your, your ecosystem, yeah. they will absolutely return all of this in spades in the form of things that, that matter to us or should matter to us. That includes resources like, like money. Yes, we are in a for-profit world in this scenario, but also in, in care and in connection and that, that depth of belongingness, which I hear so much about the culture that you are building. So something that I, I would love to talk about is, you know, like I said, there are so many people leaders and and CEOs that are early in their company building phase that are, are looking for and, and wanting to play with this idea of instituting the four-day work week. We talked a little bit about running this kind of as a pilot program, and, and you're now two years into this. If I'm listening in as a people leader, I'm very curious how, what you can share to them, for them, that they may be able to take this and run a pilot of their own. So there there are so many considerations here. This is not just, hey, as of tomorrow, we're going to turn off Fridays in the calendar. What what goes into crafting the initial pilot program of running a four-day work week within an organization? It's a great question. There's so many different things that you to think about, that you can think about. And one thing I would just say is interesting is you mentioned, you know, we did a pilot, we did a, we did a one month trial, we called it. And then we did a six month pilot. Pilot just felt like a little bit more of a, maybe (laughs) elaborate term than a trial. (laughs) The trial was really just like, let's do it. Um, And so that there's something there to that, which, and I was going to say, in a way, we're still in the pilot, like it shouldn't everything be a pilot all the time, because really we should be questioning, checking in, um, you know, evolving everything, every part of, of the company and how we run all the time. And that's how we think about it. And everything's always evolving. For us, the concept of the trial was, um, it's also, I think, pow- powerful because it removes some of those, um, those issues a little bit. You know, maybe if you can say to your company, we're just doing a one month trial of the four day work week. I think you, there's certain things that you absolutely should think about in advance, but there's some things that maybe you can figure out along the way a little bit as well. In a way, doing a trial just means like, let's just jump in and figure it out. And so some of the key things I would say from my experience now, maybe with the benefit of 
of hindsight is kind of, you know looking looking back things I maybe would have done all, all, from the beginning right away. Think about customer service, um, or or at least think about different functions, different parts of the company. How do they need to approach it differently? That was something that from the beginning we just knew we want to provide great customer service. It's something we've always prided ourselves on, and and we've over invested in that function compared to other companies. So we want to keep that going. It's not going to work to just have everyone do the same four days. Luckily for us, we already had the concept of some people work a shifted five days in advance. So right. we had some people work over the weekends and and things like that. And, and that was a bit fluid. People could change things there. And so with the four-day work week, we have that as well, where we kind of can be quite deliberate about, okay, as we're spreading the people we have in that team across seven days, um, what's the right spread with everyone working four days, so actually reducing the amount that everyone works. That's, that's one key thing. The other one is, you know, across the rest of the company, when we first did our trial, we had every team pick your own day that makes sense for you. And it was really interesting because when I first did the four-day work week in that first month, um, I took Wednesdays off. Now I take Fridays off. It's a totally different feeling. And I almost just would say like, as a company, it's like, I, I kind of I want everyone to have that feeling, and, and we really benefited as a company because a lot of people experienced that, and we could come back and say, okay, what are the pros and cons of that? Where we arrived at is that there's just so much value in aligning the day because it's just so challenging to also keep bearing in mind we are fully remote, very much like across the world. So that that's another piece that I want to bring in here as well in the four day work week is. You can't think about the four-day work week in isolation. You've got to think about mm-hmm. other aspects of the company. Your your remote or the culture, the values. What are those values? The strategy, the business model, even maybe even the customers you're serving. We serve yeah. small businesses. We have a very high volume of very low-paying customers. That's very different than if you have you know, maybe your enterprise focused. You've got really big clients. If you lose one of them, you lose. Five percent of all your revenue is is very different situation too. So right. I'm a firm believer that you've got to bring all of this together. I almost think about it literally as like if you have a table and you lay out your values, your strategy, your customer segment, all all these pieces. Only like having all of that for a lot of decisions in the company, you can only really make the right decision when you lay all of that out and, and you're thinking about all of it. Yes. So that was important for us with the four day work week as well. We just get aligned as a as a as a company, especially as a leadership team, um, on what's what are your goals? Like what's your intention with the four day work week? Are you trying to get the same level of output and results? Are you are you happy to reduce that slightly? And where we've kind of landed is that we're we're happy to maybe reduce it slightly by to like five percent but not twenty percent so that's also very interesting um so we're close on the spectrum to we want to achieve 100 percent and and i would even say maybe we can go beyond 100 percent when we really hit our stride and this is really working for us because i've found myself and i believe that and i've heard this from many people across the company as well is that i almost just feel like it's a more optimal way of of working in a sense you need I heard it best described as you have work and you have maybe leisure or your family time. And then there's also this like other piece that most people don't have, but it's, I've heard it described as idleness, pure rest. And for me, that's just thinking, but the disconnect from the work helps the work. That fifth day that now you have off, there's all those different um, components that you want to think about. But I would say maybe have a bias towards just just giving it a go and really having a strong communication from your team on how it's going and and iterate from there and but maybe also start with a belief of you know for me it's it's a belief that this really can be a more optimal way of working and one of one of my favorite things about the 4 day work week is that it's just by definition of us having a 4 day work week or you know talking about it it's we're already saying that it's kind of a belief of surely the five-day work week can't be the the best way to work. So just the pure 
ability to question that is, is I think, one of the things that I love the most about the four-day work week. I, d- I try to not get too rigid in the four-day work week as well. I would suggest thinking about the four-day work week less about the four days. You can end up rigid in the four days and, and more about um, just pushing yourself to like think about the optimal way of working and also consider having more trust in, in your team and trusting in individual people, but also the collective like individual teams within an organization. What I love the most about the four-day work week, I think, is I almost kind of want to maybe over time go beyond the four-day work week and say it's like the any day, any number of days work week. There are so many things that you've just said that I think are incredibly helpful to our listeners from, you know, starting with why. What is our goal in this? Two, having that trust and that creative open space to say, well, why do we do it this way? Question it, not in the spirit of, you know, turning over every apple cart just to be a contrarian, but to say, is this the most effective way that we could be doing work? What are our perceived and maybe created boundaries that that are in place that might be impeding us from getting to where we want to be faster? Two, I, I think that, Something that you said that is very important and I, I love very much, and, and I think that this is why Buffer has been able to, to play with so much of the cultural side of how we run an organization or how we build a sustainable business, is by putting all of those components on the table that you talked about. This is not just simply saying, we're talking about output and productivity today, full stop, or we're thinking about moving to a four-day work week because we need to reduce our burn, and we put that on the table. This is about having a holistic conversation, a strategic conversation at the leadership level around what is not working for us right now, what is our goal in changing a process, and are we considering all of the most important parts of our business to ensure that we get to the best next solution? And then to follow that up with, and we're going to reevaluate because what got us here won't necessarily get us there. We aren't going to get this pixel perfect on day one. This is a learning process, a growing process. And something that you said early in the conversation that I really want to highlight for our listeners is we should be reevaluating all of our processes on a regular cadence, not just the four-day work week or whatever you know newfangled thing that we've decided to institute, whether that's performance management or building a, a new functionality within the revenue team. So what I'm what I'm hearing you say is so much of things that I love, uh, are, and and more importantly, characteristics of very high high output, very uh, fluid organizations that are really building with people at the center, and more importantly, things that come from very successful companies on all measures of success. So thank you for for going so deep into that. Now I have a little bit more of a superficial question that I know a lot of people leaders have been asked as conversations around augmented work weeks come up within their own organizations, which is more than just like, okay, how how can I get my CEO on board? Or how can I get my founder on board? Or how might I present this to them in a way that would be more palatable? And for some companies that are a little bit more resistant, or for some companies that are just in a different place in their business life cycle, the question of pay comes in into to the conversation. The trade-off here for you was maybe a small percentage of productivity or output. But I also love that you articulated, we get that back because people have the brain space. So when they are on, they're able to be present instead of wasting away those hours and minutes in between meetings where you're literally just zoning out. And that's not, you're never gonna get into flow state with, with that. And so what what I heard you say is you're kind of condensing and consolidating that that productivity time and, and the other spaces allowing that to happen. But what about pay? So a lot of folks look on a spreadsheet and they say, okay, so we were working five days. Now we're going to work four days. That's 80%, therefore 80% pay. Yeah, I think the other thing people say or, you know, people talk about with four-day work week is four tens. So the idea of, you know, four days, uh, 10 hours a day. So you're just getting back to the 40 hours work week. The thing I would say is that now you're talking about time and you're equating pay to time. And I don't think that's the right thing to do. And it's not how we think about the, the four-day work week. So for us, it, it doesn't make sense to reconsider pay because then you're starting to say that you know you were paid for those 
five days, you really should be getting paid for your output, for the results and for how well we're all, you know, coming together and the success we're having together. And so that's really how I, how I think about it. It's interesting to connect this to remote working as well, because we've been working remotely for a long time before um, the, the four day work week. And I think for us, the only way that remote work works, and now we kind of translate this to four day work week as well, is the idea of like, you give flexibility to get flexibility. So remote work would always provide a significant amount of flexibility for people. You could, you know, be you can be working where you want to be working. You could move or travel and keep working. Um, I think it's it's an incredible thing. But to make it work, you might be your team might be spread across multiple time zones. So um, you you need to communicate with each other. That's where you know Buffer is also a high trust culture. It's also a high commitment culture. There's these pieces again, kind of everything that's on the table, bring it together. For us, the way that both remote work and four day work week. Uh, like the only way those work really well is you bring these other pieces in of the high trust, the flexibility, and and that's where it's, I'm, I'm, I, I, is we don't have a four day work week where like no one ever works on a Friday. We but it's more of a belief that we actually can have incredible results in less time, but we need to be all uh, pretty flexible if we're going to come together and we're spread across the world and we're all striving for that for that like this is the most optimal way of working i will say that um i've i've found and, and heard this uh, across the team is that with the four day work it, it just feels very different because even in the choice to do it we're choosing to be quite mindful about our level of focus and flow you mentioned flow i think that's really powerful is it so for me, I have this feeling of like with four days, and I say this as, you know, two years on at this point, I was, I wondered, is this a like, is there a honeymoon period? But two years on right. the four day work week, it feels like most of the time you can, this idea of like, I've left it all on the field. I've done 110%. You kind of, you feel like you can do 110% for, for four days. And then you can kind of be like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm like, Oh, I need the rest. I'm going to take the rest with three days as well. With a weekend, I think it's generally more powerful if you have three straight days in a row. As I mentioned, I've tried the um, split where it was Wednesday and then the, the regular weekend. But um, there's something really powerful about that as well. Uh, obviously, lots of different personal and family type situations. For me, and I've heard this a lot amongst the parents in the team, you kind of get one day for errands and, and things which often get had, had to be fit in in the two days and you end up and you really end up with this like Sunday feeling of like oh like really could have done with another day but with three days you kind of have room you have time room for everything and so that also is just and you probably have a bit of room to be like having things percolating about the work that you're currently doing as well and then you come back on Monday and you're so fresh and clear-minded and you're like excited to get into that work and you and you and you jump back in and do the you know the 110 percent again the next week so i i think it's a, a really powerful thing i love closing with that thought because it's you've made a very compelling case uh to be honest <laughs> by by being so so open with your sharing and your learning i i love the idea of of cutting off the learning curve for for other folks Sometimes you need to learn some lessons on your own. Other times you, you can learn from others and, and adopt them together as a collective. We, we can learn and grow uh, faster, right? To get to this place where we do feel like balanced, integrated, present humans, which is a big part of, of why we should be considering augmenting our work weeks. Awesome. All right, Joel, are you ready to jump into rapid fire? Yeah, let's do it. I'm ready. <laughs> so first question should be a layup here. Looking at your desk in front of you, what item sparks joy for you and why? <laughs> There's a piece of pottery, ceramic, and it's um, it says, I like you a lot. <laughs> and it's just kind of a funny in-joke with my wife. She did a pottery class early in the pandemic, and she made this for me. But it's like, it didn't like glaze well or whatever. <laughs> it's just like a piece of um, <laughs> random pottery. But... It really brings me a lot of joy. I keep it on my desk and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> I like her already. This is amazing. Okay. Second question. Buffer has been at the forefront of so many progressive people and culture policies. What is percolating for you now? What's bubbling? What's next? What's next? Um, I mean, transparency is still really, really top of my mind because we've been remote for so long. That movement is now, you know, it's, it's so mainstream. I still believe that companies can and should be significantly more transparent, transparent pay. And um, we're still in a very much a tiny minority having our salaries published publicly and having, or even having internal uh, transparency around pay. So yeah, that's probably the one that I'm, I'm thinking is, it's, it's next for the world. It's also next for us because there's so much more we can do. Yeah. It gets harder over time, the bigger you get. I'm so glad that you're thinking about that. Last question. When was the last time you were deeply proud of something you have accomplished? It's a very good question. I would say, I mean, that's a tough one. The word deeply has <laughs> got me stumped because I'm like, I mean, deeply? I've got to be really proud of this. But I would say, I think since the start of the year, I've just been very proud of how we've operated as a company. We've really increased our focus on a connection across the team. We've kind of hit pause a bit as a team and said, let's really work together to make things happen. We're, we're committed to strengthening our culture and the values again. It's a bit of a general answer, but I think that's the one that for me, um, I would just throw in a personal one that I'm very proud of, which is something I've been working with my coach on um, for quite a while is, I don't, there's a concept of like the upper limit problem or the the thing that you find really challenging that could be like holding you back um, as an individual from hitting that next level. So conflict has always been the thing for me. Like I'm, you know, conflict averse as a, as a person or have been generally, but I've put a ton of work into that in the last couple of years and really found a new relationship with conflict of how uh, powerful and healthy it can be. And um, I came across something recently that said comfortable conversations equals uncomfortable relations. Uncomfortable conversations equals comfortable relations. And I would just say I've, I've leaned into the, to the discomfort and the conflict um, quite many times in the last couple of years. And it has, I feel in a much better, more authentic place as a, as a human now. Oh, congratulations. As, as a fellow conflict averse human, I keep my Brene Brown mantra right there, you know, clear is kind. Yep. So Joel, I, I will end our conversation simply by saying thank you so very much for not only spending the time with us and sharing your wisdom, but really thank you so very much for the work that you're doing out there uh, on behalf of all of us who are, are goal aligned and values aligned and trying to create a slightly better world of work for everybody. So thank you for all that you do. And please, please keep leading authentically. Thanks so much, Caitlin. And same to you. Please keep having these conversations with so many different inspiring leaders that are giving me new ideas of, oh, I should do that now. And, and things. so I think it's just very powerful, very valuable work. Thank you. And to our listeners, thanks so much for joining me on this week's episode of All Hands, brought to you by Lattice. I'm your host, Caitlin Holloway. Follow All Hands on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss a new episode. Learn more about how Lattice can help your business stay people-focused at Lattice.com or find us on Twitter at LatticeHQ. All Hands is produced by Lattice in partnership with Pod People. Special thanks to our production team, Christine Swore, Annette Cardwell, Rachel King, Amy Machado, Danielle Roth, Jessica Pilot, and Carter Wogan. Until next time, keep leading authentically 